our loving Father, we're just so grateful, Lord, for the price that you have paid for us, the worth that you have instilled in us, the certainty that you've shown us, and the kindness by which you've treated us, Lord. And for that, this morning, we ask that you may shut us in, that you may give us your Holy Spirit, that we may be empowered to live renewed lives under your direction, for we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the people that I forgot to thank is Stephen for his song, both in Sabbath school and during the service. Thank you for that. And I love the, the um, yodel in your voice. It's a brave man that does a yodel in a church. Matthew 17, 8, if you could turn to that. Matthew 17, 8 says, And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. And although this verse is about the transformation of Jesus, I'd like to say that within it is a seedbed for a hundred sermons. Within it is a message that if Adventism heeded it today, we will have none of the divisions that we have amongst us. We would have none of the problems that we have amongst us. We wouldn't have a lack of spirituality. We wouldn't have churches that are half empty. We wouldn't have the problems that we encounter from week to week. And the reason being that it first addresses the focus. It addresses the issue of comparison. And it addresses several theological issues. It addresses the issue of focus because it says that when they had lifted up their eyes, it tells us that perhaps the crux of the issues that we face in life is that we don't lift up our eyes enough or that we don't set our eyes on the right person. If we were to lift our eyes occasionally, we would be different people. How many ways can God tell us? In Isaiah, he told us to behold our God. Pilate told us to behold the man. And John told us to behold the lamb. And you know, the word behold signifies not a casual look, not a look in a hurry as we race out the door for work in the morning, but it's a stand still and look carefully. And it says that when they looked carefully, they saw no man anymore, but Jesus only. I guess the second area there is that they saw no man anymore. What a wonderful thing it would be for us as Adventists if our eyes were not focused on others. If our eyes were not focused on what other people are doing or how other people are, and we saw no man anymore save Jesus only. You imagine a church that has a true focus on Jesus and stops focusing on what others are doing or what others are or whatever their sins are or whatever their issues are. What a potent church that would be. What a church that would go forward to conquer. And the Jesus only, I guess, addresses a great theological issue, the issue of righteousness by faith. Because righteousness by faith, rightly understood, is about Jesus only. He is my only righteousness. He is the only thing that I have to recommend myself to God. Is that not true? And it doesn't matter what as God has done in my life or how far he's brought me somewhere, at each step of the way I need to say that I have no righteousness at all save the one that he gives me. And so when we learn, when we learn the message of this verse that says, when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only, we would have learned the message 
of rejecting our righteousness and resting on a focus on Jesus' righteousness alone. We have issues that have divided Adventism for at least 160 years. The issues vary, the outcomes vary, the theological implications vary, but the crux of the issues remain, and they basically stand on two extremes. The first extreme being a conservative extreme, which focuses on performance. Whatever it is, whether it be health reform, whether it be you know, dress reform, whether it be whatever reform, whether it be loyalty issue, obedience, whatever it be, nonetheless, it sits at one end of the spectrum. While at the other end, we have a liberal focus on personal security, which is covered up by much talk about grace. Nonetheless, it is focused on my security. These people speak a lot about being saved and being secure in Christ. But my understanding is that if you feel secure, you can quit talking about security and talk about something else. Isn't that true? In fact, the constant talk about security is no evidence of security at all. It may be actually masking quite a bit of insecurity. Nonetheless, the Bible sees these two divisions and it tries to unite them in one blended doctrine of righteousness by faith in which Christ alone becomes our substitute and at the same time through his endowment of the Holy Spirit he gives to us new lives while each step of the way we reject even those new lives, even those lives that are purer than the previous lives, we reject them as having any part in our salvation. Let's read Isaiah 40 verse 2. Our security is established on what Christ has done and not on what anything that I can do. I will repeat that. My security is established on what Christ has done and not on anything that I can do. Isaiah 40 verse 2 says, It's a strange, strange verse because it sits in a context of the people of Israel being carried away to Babylon and being made prisoners. And it's in that context that God speaks this to them. They've not understood that Christ is their righteousness. They've not understood that he is all sufficient. They've forgotten to ask for the blessing and now they're being carried away and God speaks this message to them. He says, speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished and her iniquity is pardoned for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That is a marvellous statement in a context of what has just happened to Israel or what is about to happen to more people. He says, speak comfortably to Jerusalem. And I'd like to say that if I had one message to deliver to the Adventist church, it would be this one. I'd like to speak comfortably to our people, even though our church worldwide has divisions, has problems, has its issues. I would like to speak comfortably to her and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Her warfare is accomplished. People are still trying to fight a fight that's already been accomplished. Her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. And she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, God didn't just pay for our sins. This verse tells us that he gave us double for them. Double. He more than paid. He was wasteful. It was prodigal. It covered more. In fact, when Mary Magdalene broke that bottle over Jesus' feet and that perfume went all over the ground, Jesus saw a great symbol of his death in that broken um, bottle. And he saw this perfume go all over the room and perfume the whole room. And you remember one of the disciples came up to him and said, what is this waste? But he didn't see it as a waste because he knew that the fragrance of that bottle would waft through the whole room and he knew that the fragrance of his sacrifice would waft through the whole universe even though only a handful comparatively would accept his sacrifice. 
You see, he never saw his sacrifice as a waste, even though the majority of people don't accept it. And this is why he said he's given double for all his sins. Double. He didn't just pay enough. He didn't just pay the price that was required. He paid double for his sins. And we have the same, the same concept outlined there in Romans where it says, and where sin abounded, grace what? Grace did much more abound. God didn't just pay for sin. It much more abounded. You know, I'm not surprised. People say, you know, God's good to me. He said, you know, all my life I've been a wretch and he's given me all sorts of things. You know, he's been really kind to me. And I'm not surprised because God doesn't give you what you deserve. The Bible says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Much more. I love that expression. And uh, there's a similar verse in Job 11.6. And it says the same concept here. Job 11, 16, and it says, Know therefore, this is pretty certain, isn't it? God is saying, know for sure, know therefore, that God exacts of you far less than your iniquity deserves. Aren't you grateful for that? When you've done something wrong in your life, when your life's been a mess, that God exacts of you far less than what your iniquity deserves? You know, he's not interested in justice per se. That doesn't really reveal his true character. But here he shows his character of grace where he exacts of us far less than what our iniquity deserves. And I have also 1 John 3.20. Again, a, a verse that conveys a similar theme. 1 John 3.20. And it says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. That's a beautiful verse, isn't it? If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Remember my first verse that I started with, it says, when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. Well, this verse complements that. It says that even if our focus is where we're at, and the mess of our lives, that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than that. Irrespective of the way we feel, irrespective of the fact that we might be carrying guilt, irrespective of the fact that we may feel like we're not close to God, the Bible says that even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And I'm so grateful for that as well. What do you say? Amen. You know, I said before that the mechanics of salvation are not easily understood. And I'm not sure that they have to be fully understood. But I believe that we, as a church, have divided the concept of righteousness by faith into two dangerous elements. And I spoke about before the focus on obedience at the expense of grace. And I also speak about the focus on grace at the expense of loyalty. And notice I used when I'm speaking about Obedience that I didn't use, I used the L word, but the L word was not law, it was loyalty. Because a lot of people question, you know, they, they use the term, the L word for legalism, but I say it's loyalty because we have now got a doctrine that is quite foreign to New Testament faith that says that we can be under grace yet at the same time be in rebellion against God. It is not biblical, it is not founded on scripture, and you'll never, ever read it from Paul's writings or from White's writings as well. And um, that concerns me. But equally, equally concerning is the other side of the equation where we have a lot of preaching on things that we need to do and things that we need to change and things that we need to um, let go of. And they're good in themselves and they're right in themselves, but... I feel that sometimes the tone isn't right because the tone is centered on my achievement instead of what I receive from God. And that worries me. It worries me because there is nothing wrong with making a commitment to being loyal and obedient as long as at every step I reject that obedience as acting any part in my salvation. 
I can obey as much as I want and I can be as committed as I want and I can be as fervent as I want and as zealous as I want as long as I recognize that none of that is ever meritorious. That all along the way I reject my rags for his righteousness. You see, the centerpiece of Laodicean message which addresses this church is that she is parading around in a garment. She feels she's dressed. She's pointing to her clothes. But Jesus says, you don't understand. You have no clothes. I need to give you the real clothes. And every time I stand before God, I've got to stand before God in his clothes, not mine. In his righteousness, never mine. In his doing, never mine. In his substitutionary atonement, never mind. Nonetheless, to stand in those clothes, he requires of me a surrender by which I become immobilized and I become the body temple, if you please. And he can live his life in that body temple. Nonetheless, whatever life he chooses to live in me, it never contributes one thread of human devising to that garment that he gives me. Is that true? Absolutely true. And uh, Paul addresses these very issues. In Philippians 3.9, we read, I'll give you time to get that, Philippians 3.9. It says, That I may be found where? That I may be found in him. It's the only place I want to be this morning. I want to be found in him. I don't want to be found in me. That I may be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, obedience, but that which through, is through the faith of Christ, that is recognizing that he is my atonement, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, this is why the Old Testament says that his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And Paul wished to be found in him, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of faith. And as Adventists, we should be found in him not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of faith. We come back to that second issue, the issue about security. When I focus on my salvation and whether I am saved, I may actually be competing with a focus on Jesus. See, the Bible says that when I focus on him, he will guarantee my salvation. I can quit worrying about that. That I don't need to um, exert anxiety over whether I shall be saved or not. That I should rest in him. And so therefore, a constant focus on that may actually be another excuse to not focus on him and not spend time with him. And he may leave us with a focus on grace without a corresponding commitment to obedience. You see, because the more liberal sides of our church see obedience as a problem. They see it as competing with grace. But that is not New Testament faith. Paul could balance those two elements beautifully without ever, ever walking the line of legalism. In that fantastic verse in John 17, 8, we read... And this is life eternal. Here, John is saying, here it is. This is eternal life. And what did he say it was? This is life eternal that they might know. Know who? They might know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Oh, that was very clever. And he managed to get that up so quickly. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ in me was sent. Over here, John says that eternal life is not a concept. It is not an abstract. It is not a, a book change in heaven, an entry in a book of heaven. It says that eternal life is in a person. It is not possible to have eternal life without having Jesus within you see, and so John internalizes the concept of, of the righteousness of Christ 
and the commitment that goes with it. This is life eternal, that they might know thee. And the word know there is a very, very interesting word. It's a Greek word. It's the word genosko, and it means married to. It means united intimately with. You see, to have eternal life is to be intimately united with Jesus. And anything short of that, you can claim salvation all you like. But if you don't have that, you don't have eternal life. Because the Bible says, this is life eternal, that you might know thee, that you might be married to and intimate with him. You might be connected with him. You might be in him. No wonder Paul said that I may be found in him. And you know, God gave us the very concept of marriage to understand this. He said, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father, shall cling unto his wife. For this is the mystery that I speak concerning who? Christ in the church, a unity of two separate people become one. And Jesus says, this is life eternal. Notice the perfect harmony of the gospel. I'll read you several passages and you'll notice the harmony of blending those two. My commitment alone to Jesus' atonement as my only method of salvation and at the same time, a corresponding commitment to loyalty. Okay, how Paul unites those beautifully. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may attain for that which I have already attained in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.12, he says, that I may attain for that which I have already attained in Christ Jesus. Oh, isn't that amazing? That I may attain for that which I have already attained. Notice the two elements beautifully there. That which I have already attained is talking about the perfection of Jesus that covers me past, present and future. And that I may attain speaks about the life of loyalty on which we go from grace to grace in obedience to his requests. Notice the two elements beautifully. One is a commitment in a life that's walking towards that which I already have received in Christ Jesus. A perfection that he already has attained for me. A perfection that he's received, not achieved. And so Paul blends those two elements beautifully in this verse. And again in 3.16, a couple of verses down from that. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. In uh, the version that that I was reading, it says, let us walk towards that. Nevertheless, to that, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk to the same place. In other words, we are imperfect at every perfect step in Christ Jesus. But nonetheless, we're heading somewhere, aren't we? It is not a life of abandonment to the fact that I am saved. It is a life of commitment towards something. And any any person who stands up on a pulpit and divides those two elements where there's an overemphasis on grace at the expense of a commitment in obedience or there is an emphasis on obedience at the expense of Christ, my only righteousness, anybody who does that has dissected. They've they've set asunder something that God has joined together. And this is the the problem that we've had since 1856. Again, God tried to correct in 1888 through the Minneapolis messages and then again in in, uh, um, 1904 and then again in 56 and in 1970 with Glacier View and the whole Ford debacle. The whole thing has been to try and unite these two concepts that have been torn asunder and we never quite got the balance right and God is trying again to unite us under this concept a finished atonement in Christ yet an atonement that continually needs to be made by him through us in us again in Titus 3 5 Paul says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy has saved us. Notice the substitutionary work of Christ, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy has saved us. That's the work of Christ. And what happens with that work? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul doesn't deny that something happens as a result of accepting his substitutionary righteousness. He's saying with it comes the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit starts to regenerate us and change us and make us better people. You have the two elements blending beautifully there again. 
Do you know White herself had a commitment to uniting these two poles of truth? And she did it beautifully, and she followed the Pauline recipe. Please notice this statement. It's in Signs of the Times, June 16, 1890. When it is in the heart to obey God. Notice when it is. When it is in the heart to obey God. Not just in the head, but in the heart. She's talking about a center of affection. She's talking about a heartfelt appreciation for what God has done for you. You see, any religion short of a heartfelt appreciation for what God has done for you is nothing more than mere talk, dry formality, and it lacks the fundamental, the fundamental um, crux of the message. When it is in a heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, notice that the liberal brothers in our church would say that those efforts equate to legalism. But here she says, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Can you say amen to that? See the two elements blended beautifully? She says, when it is in the heart to obey, when efforts are put forth, Jesus covers us. He covers that imperfection, but he doesn't cover imperfection when there is no commitment to loyalty. Here she blends this beautifully. And we read in Romans 10.10 10, that with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, it is a heartfelt experience. New Testament faith, and I read it this morning, I was reading Steps to Christ on the way here today. I was reading a couple of chapters, just going over some of the things to make sure that the balance is right as I present it. And I read in that marvellous little book there that Faith is a heartfelt appreciation for the love of God. That's what New Testament faith is. It's when I actually recognize his gift and I'm moved inside by it. And here it says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. It's got to be a heartfelt experience. Um, please notice the rest of that statement that I read before, when it is in the heart to obey God. This is how she finishes it. And you remember I said she blends both those elements. Notice her warning. But he will not accept those who claim to have faith in him, yet are disloyal to his father's commandments. Notice that. In one hand, she emphasizes the total substitutionary work of Christ, that he can cover our deficiencies, that we need not despair, we need not be afraid, that he can make up for the deficiencies. At the same time, on the other hand, she says, but he will not accept this loyalty. It's a foreign gospel. It is not a gospel. The reason why this is so is because sin is like an iceberg. You know, you see an iceberg, you see the surface of it, and it's only a small portion of the actual iceberg underneath. I've got several pictures at home of, of icebergs from underwater pictures, and you see the, only a tip above the water. And sin is like that. Sin's infection is too deep. We are too damaged by sin. We are severely affected by it. And so therefore, to think about obedience in terms of salvation we were talking about those things that we can see and those things that we can see are usually only things like behavior and thoughts and conscious drives but underneath that lies hidden motives and subconscious desires and the deceptive pride and the deep infection of sin itself and so therefore this is why we have to believe in a substitutionary atonement again she says those who with sincere will with a contrite heart, are putting forth humble efforts to live up to the requirements of God. Notice that? Is this, is this the people who are careless and not interested in a commitment to God? She says, those who with a sincere will and with a contrite heart are putting forth humble efforts to live up to the requirements of God are looked upon by the Father as obedient children and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to them. Notice again, she beautifully blends those two elements and um, and, it's, and um, she adds to that, he adds to their work his perfection and sufficiency and it is accepted of the Father and we are accepted in the Beloved. The sinner's defects are covered by the perfection and fullness of the Lord, our righteousness. I love that, don't you? I love that. I just want to come over here and it's... Um, Zechariah just thought of a verse right now that I need you to have a look at. And it really captures this beautifully because the urgent need of the church is for a vision of Christ, okay? 
irrespective of what anybody else says. People say, oh, it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Other people say, oh, you know, the urgent thing, need for the church is persecution. You know, the urgent need for the church is a revival. You know, people say all sorts of absurdities, but the urgent need of the church is for a clear vision of Jesus. And in Zechariah 12.10, we read, and I wonder if the brother can put that up. Zechariah 12.10. Brother or sister? Looks like it's a sister. Yes. If you can't put it up, nonetheless, we've got a Bible. And it's speaking about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've got it up. Look at this. Look at this. This is about when Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit. Notice what happens. You know, we kind of think that when Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit, what we'll get is we'll get zapped with power and we can go around and heal people and all that. We're always looking for the power sanctioning, you know, instead of what it actually is going to give us. Look at it. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. It's the spirit of grace. It's that spirit that recognizes that we are saved by grace. And what will happen? And then they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Notice what they do. Who, where does their focus go when the Holy Spirit is poured out? And they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one that grieves for his firstborn. Notice what the Spirit does. First, it's a vision of Christ. Then comes a strange conviction that somehow I'm responsible for the pain and agony that Jesus died. And when I have that conviction, something happens inside. And this is the only way that the Holy Spirit can ever break the human heart. Outside of a vision of Christ, there is no way that the human heart has any capacity or capability to respond to his great sacrifice. We're doing good time? We've got a few minutes, have we? Okay. I go to many weddings. I'm Portuguese. We have a big social circle. And uh, one, of, one of the things about Australian weddings, and by the way, I was really excited in... in um, Kenya too, that they have the same concept. They have a little flower girl that walks down the aisle and she's dressed like the bride, etc. The most amazing figure at um, a wedding is always the flower girl. I, it's a strange concept. You know, she looks like the bride. She's dressed in white, isn't she? And she walks down the aisle just like the bride and she carries flowers like the bride and she has the white shoes and sometimes they have the little white handbag. And they're part of the wedding and they're going to be part of the after party. And the little girl walks towards the altar and is all excited. And the whole thing just simulates what is about to come, doesn't it? You know, the strange thing is that she looks like the bride. She dresses like the bride. She walks towards the altar like the bride. She has all the trappings of the bride. But the one significant thing is that she's not in love with the groom. <laughs> Don't you think that that's amazing? That the little girl is wonderful as she looks... She's not in love with the groom. Let me tell you, friends, I believe that this has been the problem of the Adventist church, is that we have been a flower girl instead of a bride. We've loved the concept of the, you know, the after party, eternal life, the gifts, you know, the gift table, all the trappings that come with eternal life. We transferred our selfish focus on earthly real estate to heavenly real estate. But in that, we have behaved like a little flower girl because we have not been in love with a groom. But one day, that little girl grows up. And this time, she walks down the aisle, but she walks out for a different reason. Sure, the dress is nice, the shoes are nice, the handbag's nice, the flowers are nice, the church is nicely decorated, there'll be an after party and the presents are nice. But there's one focus that day, isn't it? And that's the groom. Because she has learned that she is in love with him. Come over here to Revelation 19 because this very picture is pictured of the Seventh-day Adventist church. <laughs> 19 verse 7 and 8. Do you remember I read in Isaiah, it says, let us rejoice. And I said, if I had one message to preach to the Adventist church, it would be, let us rejoice. Well, listen here. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Let me tell you something. 
Our commitment and obedience has nothing to do with our salvation. It has everything to do with giving God honor. In fact, in um, Malachi, it says that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. It's a gift in righteousness. A gift. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has what? Made herself ready. She stopped stuffing around. She stopped acting like a little girl, like a little flower girl, and now she knows why she's heading towards the front. She knows she's going to be married and the marriage is for keeps and it's forever and she knows she needs to be in love with this person or else eternity is going to be a torture. And she finally gets herself ready and then it tells you, describes what that experience is. And it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The garment that she's given for the fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, but it has become their righteousness. It's now living through them. And so the bride has made herself ready. And that is why my urgent message to you is that when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. 